Hi everyone, uh, I'm Samuel Ortiz from Intel and together with uh, Eric Ernst from Apple, we're gonna talk about confidential computing and containers. So confidential computing, um, this may sound like yet another uh, cloud buzzword, but we actually believe that the uh, cloud computing technology is building and providing um, a way to uh, create a very interesting new threat model. So if you look at the at the uh, existing uh, trust computing base for a typical guest running on the cloud, um, it needs and includes, sorry, the uh, all these layers here from hardware to software, uh, including the hypervisor, the, the host operating system, the host kernel, the firmware, everything must be trusted by the guest. Everything that's provided by the host must be uh, trusted by the guest. And what confidential computing and the uh, related technologies is trying to build is a threat model where all the com software layers provided by the host are actually no longer trusted. So it's trying to remove each and every piece of software provided by the host out of the uh, guest TCB. This is very appealing. Um, these essentially completely remove the host software stack from the guest TCB, um, including the host firmware, the kernel, the hypervisor, everything is out. And the interesting part of this is that the tenant is the only one that can see and modify its data. No one else can see it, no one else can, can modify it. And most importantly, uh, the infrastructure owner, the CSP, the, the, uh, the, the infrastructure uh, provider does not need to be trusted anymore. So this is a very interesting uh, threat model. How do we get there? Uh, what needs to be provided by those computing, uh, confidential computing technologies to build that threat model? Well, the first thing is that the, uh, they need to protect the tenant's data. This is, this is obvious, I think. Uh, if you don't want, if you wanna remove the host software stack from, uh, from the guest TCB, uh, you wanna make sure that the host software cannot see or tamper with uh, the guest data and the tenant's data. But that's not enough. Um, we also need to let the tenant verify what it's running, which uh, software component it's running, uh, how it's running, and on top of which hardware it's running. And we're going to go through uh, those requirements in a little bit of details. So first, uh, we want comp uh, computational computing technologies to protect uh, our data. And we kind of uh, we can already do that. Uh, our data can be in three different states. It can be in transit. Uh, that is uh, typically where your data is is going through some networking pipes. And we have TLS. We have VPNs. Uh, in, in when 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 our data is in that state, it's it's basically protected. We know how to do this. Same for when the data is at rest, uh, which means it's uh, it's stored somewhere. Uh, we have disk encryption. Uh, we know how to protect uh, our data when it's uh, when it's resting in some in some physical medium. The thing that we are lacking for completely protecting our data is uh, protecting it when it's in use, when it's being computed. And to do that, we need to be able to encrypt uh, the memory where our data is being computed, where it's being loaded, and our data is also going through our CPU state, our registers, our stack, uh, all this needs to be encrypted as well. So we, we, we currently don't really know how to do this, except uh, when using uh, computational computing technologies. But protecting data is not enough um, for, uh, for confidential computing, for removing the host uh, software stack from, from the guest TCB. Um, if we protect the data and we don't know which software components uh, are using or loading or uh, modifying this data, it, we don't know which data it is. It could be completely bogus data. It could be uh, it could be rogue data. It could be malicious data. So as a tenant, um, I in order to not trust the software components coming from the host, I want to be able to not only protect my data and make sure that my uh, 
infrastructure owner cannot see or tamper, uh, tamper with it. But I also want to be able to verify that the software stack that I'm running inside my guest is the one I'm expecting to, to be running. And also that this software stack is running on top of a hardware platform that I know, and that is the expected one. If I can do both attestation and basically verify that um, what I'm running is the is what I'm expecting to run, and I can protect my data from from the host, then uh, I can I can really start building this new thread model where uh, I can safely remove the host software uh, layers from my TCB, from my uh, from my trust boundaries. In order to do this, uh, there are some hardware dependencies. Uh, protecting the data in use, uh, doing memory encryption and, and CPU state encryption, uh, together with attestation, uh, both need hardware support. Uh, you, you, you don't want to do that uh, uh, in software, uh, essentially, because if you do that in software, you, again, have to trust the host. So that need hardware support. And there are a few technologies coming from AMD, uh, IBM, uh, Intel uh, Trust uh, Domain Extensions that are providing uh, those th th these supports. So those technologies in one way or another, uh, they provide memory and CPU state encryption and integrity, integrity sorry. And they provide a way uh, to attest uh, what kind of software stack you're running in the guest. The interesting part about it is that they're all designed as hardware virtualization extensions, which means that they uh, have a strong requirement um, that if you want to do confidential computing, if you want to, as, as a tenant, as a workload, if you want to be able to take advantage of those confidential computing technology, you're going to have to run inside a virtual machine. So that brings software dependencies. As I said, if you're a, a workload and you want to be a confidential computing workload, you're going to have to run inside a virtual machine. That means that as a workload, you're going to have to indirectly talk to an hypervisor. You're going to have to talk to KVM and QMU or cloud hypervisor, for example, or Hyper-V or any hypervisor that actually supports those confidential computing technologies. OK, so now we've seen uh, what we're expecting from uh, the uh, emerging confidential computing technologies to be able to build that new threat model. Let's see how we could uh, apply confidential computing to containers. And the goal here is really to, to abstract all the dependencies that we uh, just enumerated, the hardware and software, and provide confidential computing to cloud native in a seamless form. Uh, we want this to be, uh, to be seamless for containers to consume. There are a few blockers. Um, the very first one is that RunC does not talk to KVM. RunC is the most ubiquitous uh, container runtime. And that's the one that is going to start your containers and manage your pods on Kubernetes uh, eventually. So if RunC does not talk to KVM, um, if you run your container workloads through RunC, you're not going to be able to access uh, the confidential computing hardware extension because as you remember, they're all designed as hardware virtualization extensions. So that means you cannot protect your tenant data while it's, while it's in use. And you're not going to be able to build that uh, confidential computing thread model. The other blocker is that CRI runtime expect to be able to mount container images on the host. So before launching a container uh, workload, they actually mount the container image on the host. And then they let the container, uh, the container workload access it through some namespaces or in, in some other cases through uh, virtualization uh, technologies, but they would access what's mounted on the host. If we let the Sierra runtime mount container images on the host, uh, we basically are letting the host uh, access and tamper with our data. Um, and we cannot protect uh, the tenant's data while it's at rest. So those are the two main blockers. Um, Solutions for this, solution for enabling confidential computing uh, for containers are threefold. Uh, CATA containers is the first one um, to uh, use CATA containers instead of RunC. 
and leverage the uh, hardware virtualization extensions that are providing by, uh, 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 that are providing by these uh, confidential computing technologies. Uh, the second one, the second part of the solution is uh, being able to encrypt the container li image layers, or at least verify and, and sign them. And last but not least, um, we want to be able to offload the container image service inside the virtual machine. And Eric is now going to go through those solutions in more details and explain why we think uh, they will be able to bring confidential computing to the cloud native ecosystem. The scene is all yours, Eric. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Samuel. Um, so, as uh, Samuel pointed out, um, you know, in the solution space, one of the things that we think makes sense is uh, Kata containers. But let's kind of get into that in a little bit more detail. So. Requirement is clear that you need to have a virtual machine in order to be able to leverage these um, extensions. So uh, it needs to run inside of a VM. That makes sense. Um, further, uh, you know, based on that, need to use hardware virtualization as isolation layer. So normally your CRI runtime will call into a runtime to actually create the virtual machine and run your pod inside of it. There are a few different sandbox runtimes. Um, GVisor, Firecracker, and Kata containers are, are three listed here, but you know there are others as well. GVisor, um, we didn't really see as a, a perfect match, just based on you know it's it's utilizing a user space kernel. It's not you know it, it doesn't end up booting a full virtual machine, um, so we didn't think that that would be um, a perfect match there. Firecracker, similarly, it's a uh, the Firecracker runtime um, use utilizing the Firecracker VMM. It has some limitations device-wise that make it um, a bit more challenging when using in a Kubernetes environment and when you have multi-container pods and everything else. So really, uh, we saw Kata containers is the more natural fit um, solution for this in, in that you can have full compatibility in Kubernetes. Um, you can still use VMMs like Cloud Hypervisor or um, QMU and, and really uh, you know, provide the hooks necessary to be able to leverage confidential computing. So with that, then the whole image management, as well as any real storage management, um, there are kind of two parts of it that we want to look at. Uh, one of them being service offload. So when we talk about service offload, we're really saying we don't want to mount it on the host. As Samuel kind of pointed out, like we can we can do all this work to protect our data while it's executing, but if we forget to protect it at rest, we're kind of there's no point in, in anything that we're doing. So. We want to avoid um, the CRA runtime needing to mount or do anything really with the images on the host. So the different ways we can do it, um, one of them is kind of naive, I would say, um, and that is to fully offload it to the guest. And what I'm seeing here is that um, don't do anything in, in the CRI runtime um, and instead do the pull and everything inside of the virtual machine. Um, that makes it easy, it, well, easier um, in that, it's a single, you know, service operating inside the guest. When I said it was naive before, it's, you know, you can imagine a situation where you have uh, 30 pods running on a node and each of them are running maybe the same image or maybe sharing most of the layers of their image. What you're gonna see is since it's happened inside each guest, which means it happens for every single pod, we do this image management, there's no deduplication. So every single layer is getting pulled inside each one. So it's kind of uh, a bit abusive maybe to the file system, but even worse probably for the network as well as you go ahead and pull all these images for every single pod running on that node. Um, it's a good first step. I mean, it really does uh, move things away um, and, and protect the data, but probably something uh, long-term that you would look at is to do kind of a mix where maybe you do the pulling of the actual layers on um, the host itself. So you can have um, some sharing there, but then present all of these layers um, to the guest and, and the guest then would be able to pick the appropriate ones, do the verification, decrypt, uh, at, et cetera, inside the guest itself. So I would see that's kind of, um, the hybrid option. Uh, for, for the mixed. And then, uh, the next step after that is looking at, you know, doing the encryption and verification itself. So great. We're not doing it on the host. That's wonderful, but now we actually still need to be able to do the decryption uh, and everything else. So we need a way to be able to decrypt as well as verify. I say both of those things because you can imagine a situation where your image, um, you know, you have uh, some uh, 
very confidential algorithm that you're running on top, but your base image is Alpine. You don't really need to encrypt Alpine. Um, that, that's not a secret. Um, you just need to verify that this is the Alpine you expect, and you can do that through a, a signature instead. Um, but either way, encrypted or verified, um, everything that's inside the guest brought into the guest needs to be uh, this. And in time that you pull these things out of the guest, you need to have it encrypted uh, as well. So anything that is going to be going to rest and, and kind of transporting out, we need to make sure that happens. So that's another aspect of things that need to happen. So first, let's walk through. Um, this is what, uh, you know, a high level flow of how things operate today. If you're using uh, Kata CLH runtime class, so you're using Kata containers with the Cloud Hypervisor VMM. Um, starting at the top, you know, Kubelet will come in uh, and see like, hey, there's a pot assigned to my node. It's not there. We need to start it up, um, go forward. First thing it's going to do is ask the CRI runtime to pull the image um, if the image isn't already present the CRI runtime would go ahead and, and pull this down and make it available. After that, um, Kubelet would ask the CRI runtime um, to go ahead and create the container. Uh, in doing that, um, the first step, you know, it will be making that image mounted so that way uh, it can be consumed by the container. And then after that, uh, in our case, it'll send a create container request to Kata containers. On the host, Kata Containers you're talking to is the Shim V2. And what that's going to do then is start a virtual machine. So it's going to be using, in this particular example, it'll be using VT and KVM. On top of that will be the VMM, Cloud Hypervisor, and that'll start the actual virtual machine. Once the virtual machine is up, you're running your guest kernel. The first process that comes up is the Kata agent. The Kata agent then is going to see, oh, I have this rootfs available. I'm supposed to, you know, here's a config JSON that ContainerD gave me or cryo. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and now create this virtual machine and ta-da, you have a pod working. How would this change in the case of using something like confidential computing? So runtime class, we'd have a unique one. Let's say it's Cloud Hypervisor with TDX. Similarly, Kubelet's going to do the same stuff. It's going to say, hey, I'm going to run this pod. Make sure you pull the image. ContainerD, in our naive case, we'll describe here. We're going to fully offload it. Um, don't actually Pull the image, just kind of cache the URL, uh, perhaps, and, and just move on and say everything's fine. Now, Kubelet is going to continue and say, okay, I'm ready to create the sandbox. I'm ready to create the pod. I'm ready to create a container. It's going to issue a create container request, CRI runtime. doesn't need to do any mounting at this point. Instead, it's going to just forward the information to Kata containers, that same shim v2, um, to create the container. Kata is going to start up the VM. At this point, it's going to um, do the same thing. It's you know going to boot up. The Kata agent is going to come up, but now it needs to pull the image. So what we're going to do is we have an attestation service. We have um, essentially the Kata agent will come up. It'll say, this is the image that I need. Based on that, it needs to be able to decrypt it, and it's going to need to talk to a remote attestation agent or get a way to be able to find the keys. So it'll talk to that remote attestation as an example. Um, and it'll say, this is who I am. You know, it did a measured boot of the host platform, of the kernel itself, of the VMM, of the guest kernel, of the Kata agent, up to that point, all measures so we can say, this is who I am. Uh, you, you should trust me. Um, please give me the keys so that way I can work on decrypting all the layers of your image so we can run your workload. So at that point, assuming everything looks good, we get the keys. We're able to decrypt and we're able to have mount the image. And at this point, we're at the same situation where we were before in the traditional case where we have a rootfs on the file system in the guest and we want to launch a container and things just continue normally at this point. So stepping back, like, great. Um, on, on a slide, we show that it all works. Um, and and let, let's pretend, you know, we're a little bit ways out and all of this is working end to end. What does this really mean for the end user? Um, confidential computing is very powerful. It's a, it's a great new threat model um, um, to be able to provide um, that security and privacy and everything else for the end user. What does it mean for the developer? Um, unlike existing technologies today, really, it means absolutely nothing. You can get confidential computing without needing to change your workload. You're just writing a container. Um, the thing about that, though, is you really should follow the same best practices you always do. Namely, if you have a backdoor in your base image, your your top layer, like this confidential, is no longer confidential. It can be exposed elsewhere. So make sure you know what you're running. I would say that that's the only thing is you should maybe focus a little bit more because you're trying to be confidential. Um, 
On top of that, uh, I call this a tenant user. This is the person who's going to do QCuddle apply, you know, who is actually owning like the uh, the YAML, who's who's running the workload itself. Maybe it's the same person, the developer, maybe it's, maybe it's somebody else. In doing that, what does this really mean? There's two parts. Um, one, you're gonna need to update your pod spec, actually, just generally. Um, you're going to need to use this specific runtime class, just like you would do if you're using a sandbox runtime. And on top of that, you're gonna want to specify how do I attest. So um, if you are uh, getting keys from a remote attestation server, you need to be able to specify, hey, use um, this URL to be able to communicate to get the keys and, and pull everything else down. So that would have to be custom um, per. And then top of that, I would say, maybe that was the person doing the YAML. Maybe there's a person who's actually, you know, at the company who's using the service, who's, who's setting up the infrastructure for um, uh, running their workloads. This person would have to, one, set up an attestation service. So that way you can go through and take the measurement from the cloud provider um, and be able to see, yes, this is the hardware and everything else. This is what I expect it to be running in. And who would then be able to manage providing keys such that we could decrypt it if everything looks good in the running environment. Similarly, this person would also have to, um, you know, manage actually encrypting uh, with those keys, encrypting the images and everything else and providing the container images. So a little bit of extra work there in order to be able to leverage. Um, as far as a provider is concerned, one, you have to install a runtime that supports confidential computing. So I didn't put it here, but that's that's kind of a base start. If that's in place, um, there's there's kind of a couple of things. Introspection doesn't really exist anymore. So if if you're running like something that that goes through like a, a Falco or something like that, and you assume that you have processes running the host that you can look at, you can't anymore. So um, that's that's not there. And, and again, that's the whole point of what we're doing after all. So. A little bit of a change of uh, how you manage things, but two, um, there is often like for all the different architectures, the number of keys that are available for encrypting each trusted domain, each uh, VM, is a finite resource. So you're going to need to treat it like a finite resource that you can schedule against, and that'll be something you know um, like a device plugin. Um, so that that's what it means uh, for there. So ultimately, like not too much changing, nothing, nothing too drastic. Let's talk about gaps then of where we actually are today um, versus kind of uh, what we're working on and, and what's coming in the future. So on the Kata container side, um, there's a few different parts. Um, one is be able to uh, make sure we're using a VMM that has these APIs to leverage the confidential computing um, hardware virtualization and uh, make sure that in doing that, we are creating configuration knobs for the user to be able to specify things like, how do we get the keys? Um, how do we do attestation? How do we um, actually enable confidential computing in general? So adding these. On top of that, there's the actual key provisioning. Again, depending on the architecture, we're going to be getting keys from different ways. We could be getting it from the firmware um, on the host. We could be getting it from a remote server. Uh, in, in general, we need a way for the Kata agent to be able to get those keys so that way it can go through and decrypt the images. As part of that, we're going to have to be able to do attestation. Um, we're going to have to be able to have a set way to be able to have a measured view up to the point and including the Kata agent inside of the guest in order to facilitate um, you know, responding to a remote attestation that says, this is who I am, please give me the keys. Um, and then on top of that, the agent API, we're gonna have to um, lock down a little bit more and remove some of the features. Example, you can cube control exec into a container today and poke around. If you can do that in a confidential environment, um, things are a bit broken, it's not confidential, you can just access, get in, all the different debug and kind of ways to interact. We really need to lock some of those down. So some of the aspects of the agent API itself will remove so that way we can indicate clearly that this is not supported in this configuration. And the image side, this is, you know, on the Kata side, we can figure all that out, but this is this is where it's a lot more fun and interesting um, interacting with kind of some of the pod lifecycle that we take for granted and being able to facilitate doing this image service offloading, being able to have like a remote target for who does snapshotting instead of inside the guest. So there's a lot of opens there and really, you know, we're looking forward to talking to folks on it. Similarly, how do we do image layer encryption? 
Um, this is something, you know, that is beyond the scope of what we're just looking at. This is something already well discussed and in progress from an OCI specification standpoint. So overall, stepping back, um, some, some kind of takeaways and summary. One, confidential computing requires VMs. So uh, keep that in mind. And, and that's really, again, why we're focused as Kata containers and other VM isolated uh, workloads is, is a good target for this. Um, there are a lot of different implementations from a hardware perspective on how confidential computing is being carried out. Um, but, you know, our goal and what we're working on is to abstract it away so that way they don't have to be exposed to this, uh, but still make it clear to understand what uh, level of isolation is there um, for the user. Uh, and, you know, for the end user who down the road just wants to use this, really, they don't have to think about too much. As long as the attestation frameworks and everything else are in place, you know, you are right in your same YAML and just adding a different runtime class ultimately. So um, it shouldn't have to change. You certainly don't, shouldn't have to change your actual application itself. Um, and then the last point is that this is very much a work in progress. Um, and the, you know, the goal of kind of presenting here is to really put it out there, get people um, to think about it and look for getting input and discussion from folks, so. At this point, I think we are open for Q&A and we do have a link here to um, the outstanding issue that Samuel has put together um, to kind of uh, look at bringing support for Kata containers for confidential computing end to end. Thank you very much.